Spirit of life, God of love, open our hearts and enter in. That hearing your word of love, we may become love for others and find faith to believe it when Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. We make our prayers in his name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from the 8th chapter of the book of Genesis. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Listen now for God's word as it comes to you and for you. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. And the waters gradually receded from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains appeared. At the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent out the raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent out the dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground, but the dove found no place to set its foot, and it returned to him, to the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took it and brought it into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark, and the dove came back to him in the evening, and there, in its beak, was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, and it did not return to him any more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Title of the sermon this morning is The Raven That Won't Return. We've all been tracking time these days when we came back here to in-person worship a few months ago. And our greetings then would often start with a declaration of how long it had been since we'd been in here. We've all been tracking time these days. And we know how long it has been since we'd seen one another, how long it had been since we'd seen our grandchildren or grandparents. We've all been tracking time these days, keeping a close eye on the numbers. Genesis 7, 4. In seven days I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Genesis 7, 6. Noah was 600 years old. Genesis 7, 10. After seven days the waters of the flood came on the earth. Genesis 7, 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month on the Seventh day of the month, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. Genesis 7.17, the flood continued 40 days. Genesis 7.24, the waters swelled for 150 days. Genesis 8.3, the waters gradually receded from the earth at the end of 140 days, the waters had abated. Genesis 8.6, at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark. Time is not allowed to merely pass 
in the flood narrative, it must be counted. 7, 40, 150, 40. The numbers, they follow no pattern. Some are rounded up, some are rounded down. The sevens and the forties are sacred numbers. The date of the flood is specific. The only relationship the numbers have to each other is to the purpose that they serve in the story, like Noah and like the ark and like God in the water, the passing of time is a character in this narrative of recreation. The rising of the sun and the setting of the same day after endless day is the tick-tock of the clock that Noah hears. The Scripture is matter-of-fact about Noah's otherworldly perseverance. He builds a giant ark at God's command and he perseveres under the mocking stares of his neighbors and he never doubts that what he is doing is necessary. He never tries to change God's mind. But even Noah, even God's chosen one, whose children have been chosen to repopulate the earth. Even Noah, trusted by God to preserve what was made on days four and day five and day six of creation. Even Noah is helpless. He's helpless before the relentless march of time Sun up, sun down, water swells, water subsides, water is still. Tick, tock, tick, tock. The passing of time is the sound track, the only sound for life between a past that is gone and a future that is underwater. Tick, tock. There is more than one way to witness the passing of time on the threshold. The threshold where Noah is right now. And Noah keeps tabs on the sun's rise and the sun's fall. 7, 40, 140, 150. Lately, we have been tracking time with a different set of numbers you can't find on the clock. B16172, the official classification of the Delta Variant, 69.6, the percentage of adults in America that have received at least one shot of the vaccine, 6.5, the percentage of growth in the U.S. economy in April, May, and June, 11 million, the number of adult renters considered seriously delinquent on their rent and potentially in danger of losing their housing after the moratorium on evictions expired yesterday. 600,000. The number of families in our country quietly grieving the loss of a loved one to COVID-19. Two. The number of times the CDC has changed their guidance on mask wearing this summer. When we piece together the numbers that we have all been tracking, what emerges is that our time on the threshold is still passing. Tick tock. Threshold time is characterized by a profound sense of disorientation. On the threshold, additional information is useless in the absence of any recognizable patterns. A deep sense of unknowing about where exactly we are on the journey has set in. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, We walk in circles, unsure of where to turn next. 
And like Noah standing before the open window of his ark with no point of reference, no, the horizon where the sun rises and falls and where the water ends finally. The horizon looks near and distant at the same time. He's in the boat, and the boat will be the womb out of which creation will be born again. But first, what is of God's creation must die and be buried beneath the dark water. The boat will be the womb from which another beginning will commence. But first, the earth must be cleansed, God said. Washed away by a 40-day storm. Sanctified by the water. The boat will give birth to a brand new set of numbers as enough time passes for a new story to be written over the old one. But first, before it can all be born again, the raven must return to announce that the time is now. Did you notice it's the dove, not the raven, that that I remember from the flood story? What about you? Did you know there was a raven? The raven just gets one measly little verse. You've heard about the dove returning to the boat with an olive leaf stuck between his beak. The one that renews our confidence that for every moment when we're called to step out of the boat, God has got a dove to remind us that the ground beneath us will be firm. Oh, the raven just gets one measly little verse at the end of 40 days. Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent out the raven, and it went to and fro, to and fro, until the waters were dried up from the earth. But the raven did not return. That is it. That's all we get. We don't know why the first bird that was sent from the boat did not come back with the good news that the water had subsided enough that we could begin counting down the day, down to the day when Noah's forced confinement will finally be over. And what's going on with this raven? The raven must have been too preoccupied with its newfound freedom to return with news about whether Noah must keep waiting or could could begin planning for life on the other side of the threshold. If anybody wants to start a support group for people that are still waiting for the raven that won't return, let me know. I will host it in my home. Drinks are on me. The raven just makes this brief appearance before gliding off. The raven was supposed to bring back certainty that the ground below was clearing. The raven was supposed to return with a sign that the hope, that our hope was still alive, that there was life on the other side of the threshold, that there was solid ground to stand on beneath Noah's boat that had run aground, stuck teetering on a high mountain, no longer floating on floodwaters, but still not done with the journey. The raven refuses to return with news, any news, good or bad, specific or general, about the state of things out there. The raven's unwillingness to tell Noah what he needs to know is reminiscent of where we find ourselves now. Plenty of information, but no pattern emerging. The waters have subsided enough to open up our windows for a look, but still we're unsure of what we see, of what comes next, of what's happening deep within us. Enough time has passed for us to assume creation must be tired of flooding us with uncertainty. A return to normal should be available for those who have remained obedient. But instead, 
it appears that we are stuck in a boat on the side of a mountain with only the passing of time to keep us company. What is your raven that refuses to return? Is it freedom that you once possessed to move about without consciously worrying that your body or someone else has carried an imperceptible threat to life? What is your raven that won't return? Is it time with family that you can't get back? What is your raven that won't return? Is it certainty in the moral exceptionalism of America, a sense that eventually everybody will calm down? What are your ravens that refuse to return? I don't expect you to tell me what yours are, but I'll tell you what mine are. Mine is certainty. The time is linear, which means events are sequential, which means for every effect there is an easily identifiable cause. I see now that my raven of certainty needed to fly away. And mine is confidence in my own capacity to muddle through anything for as long as necessary until I grow accustomed to the pain or it stops. And I'm seeing now that my raven of pride in my own tolerance for pain needed to fly away. And mine is a conviction that even when you don't know what to do, just do something. At a minimum, look busy by having an opinion. I'm seeing now, many months after the start of this flood, that my bias for action while standing on a threshold needed to fly away. The good news is that for every raven that will not return, it appears there is a dove that will come back with a small sign about the size of an olive leaf that that beneath the flood water, new life is sprouting. But before we can reach for the dove, we must notice our raven that didn't return. I know some people that struggled with a raven that wouldn't return. They were a young, healthy, married couple. They both came from big families. And when it came time to settle down and begin their own, they agreed that they wanted to have about 20 kids. And they loved children. They were good with them. In fact, both of them acted like big kids most of the time. 20 kids, they thought they were certain. That was the number, but they soon realized that wanting to have children and being ideally suited to be parents would not be enough. The raven would not return. The doctor told them their bodies weren't well suited to participate in the mysterious wonder of forming new life that shares your DNA. But the flood of unfair setbacks was just beginning with that little bit of news. They tried multiple rounds of fertility treatments, but the raven would not return. They searched for a suitable surrogate, but the raven would not return. In vitro fertilization left them almost bankrupt. The raven would not return. They looked into adoption, but the process was too lengthy and expensive. The raven would not return. Then the grief hit as if the child they desperately wanted and deserved had died. The raven would not return, and the grief almost ended their marriage, almost signaled the end of their threshold time. The raven would not return, and then one day, on a walk through their neighborhood, a kid they knew from down the street 
that had multiple disabilities waved at them through the open window of his mother's minivan. And something happened in that moment. When they got home, they began to talk about their journey with the kind of honesty that changes people from the inside out, what the Bible calls transformation. In that moment, it was as if a dove had returned with just a single small leaf. With that small leaf in their hands, they began to pray together every morning before work. And over the next few months in their conversations, they continued to return to, their, to the boy in the minivan. And they determined that they would invite his family over for dinner. They didn't know it at the time because you don't know when you're in the middle of threshold time that a simple invitation would be the moment when they both admitted that the raven was not returning. One dinner turned into a weekly occasion, and as their friendship grew with the family down the street, they learned of other parents in their small town that were raising children with physical disabilities, and so they also met them. And before long, they'd connected with five new families and five children that were like the boy that waved at them through the open window of the minivan. They could not have children of their own, but they were now friends with parents of children that could use as many parents as possible. So they did something simple. They offered to spend one night a week at their homes. They would be surrogate parents for an evening so the biological parents could go to dinner, run errands, or just take a really long, slow walk. I define threshold time as a period of discontinuity through which God transforms life so completely that those who pass through are unrecognizable to those who did not. You can't choose threshold time for yourself. It opens up to you, expanding and contracting in time with clocks that are concealed up in the cosmos. You can't make threshold time move faster in order to hurry and get to the end. But you can decide that the transformation at work is worth the wait. And so while we wait, may we notice the small olive leaf that did come back. It is a sign that even though the ground is still covered with water that you cannot control, time is passing. God is up to something. Soon, we will see. In the name of God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.